Welcome to Italy, one of Europe's most famous countries, if not the most famous nation on the continent. Known for such things as extraordinarily delicious food, world-renowned art, and not being able to win a war even if their life depended on it. Surrendering to Captain Weber's dog is more appropriate than surrendering to an Italian. The country is located in southern Europe and occupies the entirety of the Apennine Peninsula, which is best known as the boot that's kicking a deflated ball. With such a large territory, Italy is home to around 60 million people, 2.8 million of which live in their capital and largest city, Rome. To the north, the country borders France, Switzerland, Austria and the femboy promised land, Slovenia. However, within its own territory, it also borders the microstates of San Marino and the Vatican, also known as the place that sponsored the German military's vacation to South America in 1946. Annually, the country is visited by 65 million people, which makes it the fifth most visited place on Earth, and that is for good reason. The country is so densely packed with history that it makes a can of sardines look like the American suburbs. The country used to be the home to many ancient people such as the Umbrians, Latins, Celts, Veneti, hell even the internally bankrupt aka the Greeks. And many others, but arguably the most famous ones being the Romans, who would go on to conquer the most of Europe. Civilizing us filthy little non-Latin speakers, introducing us to the glory of Western culture. <laughs> and forever ruining the Polish language by spreading their script. Seriously, what is this? <laughs> Even after the fall of the Romans, the country was home to numerous kingdoms and empires such as the Ostrogothic, the Frankish, Holy Roman, the Byzantine, the Papal States, and so many more smaller Italian kingdoms that were constantly splitting and unifying like a toxic high school couple. In the 14th century, it was the birthplace of the Renaissance, which spawned so many great works of art and science, such as the Mona Lisa, the works of Leonardo da Vinci, and the Sistine Chapel, and so many others. Not to mention, the Italy had a crucial part to play in the European discovery of the New World, as the honorary war criminal himself, Christopher Columbus, called the place his home. However, today he continues to live rent-free inside of American teachers' heads. Fuck Christopher Columbus. Ho's mad, ho's mad, ho's mad, ho's mad. To call Italy's involvement in the world's history and culture influential would be putting it lightly, nothing but an understatement. And as Italy is so compact with lore, we'll be tackling it city by city in this four-part series, starting from where it all began. None other place but the city of Rome. But before we get into the nitty gritty of the city, a big thank you to today's sponsor, Ratepunk. As someone who travels a lot, one of the biggest hurdles in planning my trips is finding cheap accommodation. It's no secret that hotel prices can vary significantly on different booking websites. Ratepunk is a free browser extension that scans all main booking sites and runs a live price comparison for the same hotels. It saves you a pretty penny and finds you the best deal by popping up in seconds. With Ratepunk, rather than spending an unnecessary amount of time listing through all the possible booking websites and trying to figure out which offers the cheapest deal for your wallet, you'll have more time to plan the actual fun parts of your trip. There are no extra steps to do after the extension is installed on your laptop. Every time it starts working automatically. So after a while, you forget you have it installed and it will be there showing you a comparison. It's available on all major browsers, Chrome, Safari, etc. And there are no signups and no commitment. And once again, it's completely free. So what's there to lose? Click the link in the description and try Ratepunk for your next trip. Being such a legendary city, Rome has many legends relating to its foundation. However, the most famous one of the two brothers, Romulus and Remus, who were believed to be sons of the Roman god of war, Mars. As infants, they were seen as a threat to the then king's rule. Thus, they were abandoned on the bank of the Tiber River to die. The two survived through divine intervention and were nursed by the she-wolf. After growing up, they decided to build their city, the city of Rome, as a way to regain the throne of the kingdom. But as the two could not agree upon which hill they should erect the city, Romulus ended up killing his brother Remus and founded the city alone as its first king. After the city was established, Rome was ruled by a king for around 250 years, until in the late 6th century BC, when the Republic was founded. 
From then on, the city and republic itself went through a period of expansion, taking over kingdoms within the Apennine Peninsula, expanding into the good old powder keg of Europe, the Balkans, the Iberian Peninsula, and even Northern Africa. By the second century AD, Rome had grown into the world renowned empire it is known today, spanning across the three continents and engulfing most of Europe. When entering the city all over you will be reminded of its ancient past, as it almost seems that on every corner there are some ruins of the ancient republic and empire. Ancient gates and columns decorate the city as automobiles pass through their arches going on their way. It's truly mind-blowing how ancient ruins are so well intertwined with the modern urban landscape, as both can coexist in the same place as some sort of symbiosis. On the outskirts of the city center lies our first church, the Basilica of San Giovanni in Laterna, also known as the Cathedral of Rome. Constructed in the 4th century, it is one of the oldest and most important basilicas in Rome. What makes this church important is that it was built by none other than the Emperor Constantine himself, and under him the Roman Empire was granted the freedom of religion, which was a big deal then, as the Romans had a tendency to put up Christians into tea poses on the outskirts of major cities. Since its construction, it served as a papal residency up until the 14th century. Due to an earthquake, most of the original church was lost, however, with a reconstruction effort in the 17th century, the church was given its new light with its, at the time, modern Baroque facade. West of the Basilica lies Rome's most famous landmark which everyone, including even the Americans and their mothers from rural Tennessee, know about, the Colosseum. The Colosseum, also known as the Flavian Amphitheater, was a grand arena built in the first century. It is so old that if Jesus wasn't left T-posing in the desert, he could have lived to see its erection. It was constructed by the Flavian emperors on the grounds of Nero's golden house, as the emperor saw the previous emperor, Nero, as a selfish tyrant they decided to build a gift to the people on top of his property. Because nothing says love for one's own country like a giant arena where people stab each other to death. With the end of the Colosseum's construction, the Emperor Titus held a celebration that lasted 100 days and included a variety of games within the Colosseum. What made the Colosseum stand out from other amphitheaters is that unlike the others who were built within hillsides for extra support, the Colosseum was completely self-sufficient in its architecture standing alone with just the support from its stone vaults. Within the walls, a total of 50,000 spectators could be seated, which is around the population of an entire small modern-day city. The main events hosted within the Colosseum were, as you know, gladiator fights, where fighters would face off in hand-to-hand -hand combat against each other or against various animals. No, I don't mean people who use the light team on Discord, but like actual animals, lions and such. On special occasions, they'd set up the stage to simulate a naval battle, bring in ships and water. In the medieval days, the Colosseum was turned into a church, and then later on into a fortress that protected the city. Being one of the seven wonders of the world, the amphitheater receives over 7 million visitors annually. So if you're looking to check it out, be aware, it will be hella crowded. Near the Colosseum, you can also find numerous other ancient ruins such as the case with the Arch of Constantine, which is a beautiful 21 meter high arch commemorating Emperor Constantine's victory over Emperor Maxentius. Behind the arch you can also find Palatine Hill, which is one of Rome's famous seven hills. During ancient times, the hill was seen as one of the best neighborhoods within the city. As such, it used to be the home of emperors and noblemen. A lot of its reputation came from the belief that it was the site where Romulus and Remus were found thus making it sort of a holy site for ancient Romans. Here you can see a variety of ruins such as Flavian's palace, the stadium of Domitian, the hut of Romulus and many others. A bit further west you can also find the Forum of Augustus alongside the Temple of Mars. Named and built adequately by Emperor Augustus, the Forum was used to commemorate the Battle of Philippi, where the Emperor avenged the assassination of Caesar. Alongside with that, the Forum was also used to provide additional space for the courts of law, where many criminal prosecutors and selections of jurors were taken place. Ego cumi la mulire turpitudinem non abui. A bit further up lies one of Rome's more significant squares, Piazza Venezia, located between the National Museum of Palazzo di Venezia and the Church of Santa Maria di Loreto. The square catches the viewer's eyes as it is home to the altar of the fatherland. In the 20th century, between 1929 and 1943, Palazzo Venezia used to be the seat of the head of government and the great council of fascism, and also the place where the CEO of racism himself, Benito Mussolini, gave many of his speeches. Helicopter, helicopter. 
The altar itself was brought to life in the late 19th century, celebrating the unity of Italy, which was a multi-decade process lasting from 1815 until 1871, when most of the Apennine Peninsula came under the control of the Kingdom of Sardinia. And then finally, with the formation of the Kingdom of Italy, the Papal State was also incorporated, unifying the entire peninsula. Essentially, the monument honors the memory of Italy's first king, Vittorio Emanuele, whose statue you can see right in the center of the monument, riding his noble steed. What also makes this building interesting, and even slightly controversial other than the fact that it had uh, quite an interesting purpose in the 20th century to say the least, is that it was built in a fusion of Greek, German and Teutonic architectural styles, which many find out of place for Rome and generally for this part of the city. Besides that, during its construction, many medieval renaissance, hell, even ancient Roman buildings had to be torn down, which has stirred many mixed feelings amongst the locals. Going further west lies yet another ruin site known as Largo di Torre Argentina. Although at first glance the site doesn't seem like much, back in ancient times it used to be the home to four temples and the famous theater and Curia of Pompeii, also known as the place where Julius Caesar experienced how it is to live in London for a day. Other than that, the theater of Pompeii is also known as the oldest theater in Rome, built all the way back in 55 BC. Not too far north lies the Pantheon, one of the best preserved monuments of ancient Rome. The structure was built between 25 and 27 BC, and originally it is believed to have been a temple dedicated to all Roman gods. This is also reflected in the name of the building, which comes from Greek and means all the gods. The light entering from the oculus also has a mystical meaning, it symbolizes the presence of God. The present day Pantheon actually isn't the original monument because the previous one was destroyed in a fire, much like most of my things at my ex's apartment. <laughs> the Pantheon's dome was the largest one in the world for over 1300 years, only being beaten by Florence's cathedral in 1436. Another reason why the Pantheon is famous and visited by millions of tourists every year is because of Raphael, one of the greatest painters of the Italian Renaissance, being buried there. South of the Pantheon lies yet another one of Rome's interesting churches. While many churches in the world came into existence as a way of worshipping the Almighty Lord, the Church of Gesù came into existence out of spite. It was built during the 16th century when the Protestant Reformation caused Europe to go into an artistic meltdown over whose version of Jesus was better. <laughs> Thus the church was built as a way to have the masses focus on the altar and the orator, rather than whatever the protestants were doing. <laughs> Further west you can find Piazza Navona, one of the most beautiful and famous squares in the center of Rome. The square consists of many fountains and sites, the most famous ones being the Fiumi Fountain and Sant'Agnese in Agone. The Fiumi Fountain is a fountain that was designed in 1651, and when translated, the fountain's name means the Fountain of Four Rivers. Because the fountain was built on the allegories of the four rivers, the River Ganges, the River Nile, the River della Plata, and the River Danube, also, the four rivers represent four continents, Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. The stunning fountains and buildings, there is the church that definitely stands out, uh, that is the Santa Agnese in Agone. Santa Agnese in Agone is a 17th century Baroque church that of course faces onto the Piazza Navona and is one of the main urban spaces in the historic center of the city. The church brightens up the square with shiny marbles and intriguing facade, is a popular destination and is one of the most notable sacred relics that is visited by many people from all over the world. West of the piazza, standing across the mighty Tiber River, is the St. Angelo Bridge. What makes this bridge significant compared to any other collection of stones across a body of water is that it is one of the oldest bridges in Rome, dating all the way back to the 2nd century. Across the bridge is the mighty castle of St. Angelo that has stood its ground ever since the 2nd century. Originally built by the Emperor Hadrian, it served at first as a mausoleum and didn't have any relations to the Archangel Michael until the late 6th century. It gained its modern name as Castel Sant'Angelo when the Pope saw the Archangel on top of the building sheening his sword to symbolize the end of the plague that was devastating Rome at the time. Thus on top of the castle you can find the statue of Michael doing just that. West of the Tiber River and the castle of Sant'Angelo, the world's smallest nation can be found, the one and only Vatican. While Rome has a reputation of touching tourists' hearts, the Vatican has a reputation of touching... You know what? No, I'm not gonna make this joke. 
Kirtina, Kirtina, U, Kirtina, Kirtina. With a population of 825 people and an area of just 44 hectares, you might be wondering how in the name of Holy Mother Mary and Joseph is the Vatican an independent state and wasn't just annexed by Italy. And the answer to that, dear viewer, like most other things, lies in the past. As I mentioned prior, before the unification of Italy, the Apennine Peninsula was divided amongst numerous other kingdoms and republics. Amongst these nations existed the Papal States, a quite sizable country controlled by the Pope as its supreme leader. So in the 19th century, as the Kingdom of Sardinia gobbled up more and more territory to form the Kingdom of Italy, the Papal States were the final frontier. Thus, against their will, the Pope's lovely country got invaded and annexed. For years after this, the Pope bitched about losing his territory, so finally in 1929, the King of Italy and Big Chin Duce Mussolini gave the Pope some land within Rome and proclaimed it an independent country, as well as gave him monetary compensation for the territory they took from him. And thus the Vatican was born. Nonetheless, within the tiniest country on earth, there are several grand sites to see. For example, the larger church in the world, St. Peter's Basilica. Built in the Renaissance style and above the burial site of St. Peter, one of Jesus' twelve disciples, the church started construction in the early 16th century and took over 120 years to build. It had five architects and it is said that over 90 popes are buried under the basilica. The building is often regarded as the greatest building of its age. Many proclaim St. Peter's Basilica uh, is the prime example of traditional Renaissance and Baroque architecture and as such has been an inspiration for churches across the world. Within the church you can also find numerous works of artwork done by the finest renaissance artists of their time, the most famous of which was Michelangelo, who personally worked on the basilica's dome. The cupola is ornamented by over 96 frescoes depicting various biblical figures. Although Michelangelo did not live to see its completion, his pupil Giacomo finished the project. Alongside that, various statues decorated its interior, again done by Michelangelo and several others. Within the microstate you can also find the Vatican museums, which carry an enormous collection of art and artifacts acquired by the Catholic Church throughout the centuries. It is estimated that the museum carries over 70,000 pieces and 20,000 are currently on display. The museum is so large you can spend well over a day going through the rooms looking at the collection. However, the most iconic parts of the museum would have to be none other than the Sistine Chapel. Although on the outside doesn't seem like much, its interior is absolutely mind-blowing. The entire chapel is covered from head to toe with frescoes done by Renaissance masters of the 15th century. Arguably the most important painting is located on the ceiling and is known as the Last Judgment, considered by many to be one of the greatest achievements of western painting. On top of the ceiling you can also find the famous creation of Adam. Taking pictures within the chapel is strictly forbidden, but thankfully I am from the Balkans, so everyone just assumes I can't read. I don't know. This be a DVD I don't know. But this would all just be scratching the surface of Rome. There are so many more places I didn't mention and get to visit, because again, Rome is such a vast city, densely packed with history and culture. And much like I've mentioned previously in my Istanbul episode, you can literally just spend days wandering, discovering something new within this city. It is a truly magnificent place that you can feel as if you've actively been traveling through time, visiting all the well preserved buildings and artifacts telling the story of humanity's progress. From ancient times to medieval ones, to the renaissance, to the modern age, Rome is nothing more of a staple of humanity's story and I implore every one of you to come and visit here at some point in your life. And once more I wish to give big thanks to all the wonderful members that helped me in providing you with these videos. If you enjoy my content, consider becoming a member like these wonderful people, Craig Zeeves, Mickey D, Pavan, Anthony YouTube. Roland S, Nequa, Emmanuel Donchilla, Andre Sorin Parskiv, Poodle Ross, Rember Lads, Jozef Borat, PC Chan, Seal King, Baduvu, Vangelis Gru, Pope Pierce, Adam Cube, Marius Stan, Matei Radu, Raj, Exalted, TD45, and Berker1237. My name is Janos, and you've watched Living Ironically in Europe. Hey, hey, why are you